Hello, my name is Dr Kate Bradley and I'm going to talk to you today about the history of making law accessible to those on low incomes, how this has changed over time and why this matters today. My interest in this question comes from an experience I had in the late 1990s when I was working for a charity in East London. I tended to work there in the evening after part time after I'd been at work myself and the only other people who were there in the evening were the people who were involved with the Free Legal Advice Centre. There was a paid coordinator who I'd bump into in the offices that we'd chat to as we were kind of preparing for our evening's work. And then from about five o'clock, the volunteers, solicitors and barristers would start arriving, coming over at the end of their working day and doing preparation for what was essentially an evening shift that started about seven. And although the Free Legal Advice Centre had done criminal work in the past, they were just kind of working with people's civil problems. But the people who really caught my eye were the clients. People would start queuing up for this free legal advice centre from about five o'clock, as soon as they'd left work, sometimes earlier. No matter what the weather, people would be there waiting patiently and often looking quite nervous and kind of stressed at the same time. I was intrigued by this because it was clearly important enough for them that they would stand there in often quite unpleasant weather waiting to see these lawyers. At that point in time, I didn't know a massive amount about legal aid or advice. I sort of knew about the legal aid scheme, but I didn't know about the pro bono work that the legal profession did, or how this was kind of part of a bigger picture about rights or welfare more generally. And it's something that I've been kind of spending my time since then finding out more about. We interact with the law in a whole huge number of ways in our everyday lives, whether that's kind of um, buying things in shops or driving a car down the street. And as we kind of grow up and kind of have different life experiences, we have a good, understand, good lay understanding of the law and how it applies to us. But what happens when things go wrong? What if we have problems with our employers or with our family members or landlords um, or if we have trouble obtaining benefits or services? What do we do then? How do we know if we need a lawyer? And what if we don't think we can afford one? What do we do? Where do we go? Now, historically, there have been lots of different ways of getting support. For example, the work of Carolyn Steedman talks about how magistrates and low lawyers would write legal letters to help people who had been slandered or libelled by others or who were trying to get money back from people who owed them. Jennifer Davis has also written about how the London police courts, which were there to deal with criminal matters, were used by ordinary Londoners to go and get advice on a whole array of matters. Also, lawyers from, well, since about the 1750s have been writing books that give anyone who could read advice on how to, how to manage the law. And we can also find examples of people like William Unwin, a mid-Victorian property lawyer in Sheffield, who subsidised work for the poor of the city through the lucrative property work he did for the um, steel, steel magnates of Sheffield. But as the 19th century progressed, there was an increasing sense that this really wasn't enough. Now, there are risks and inequalities in rural agricultural societies, which Britain had largely been before the 18th century. But certainly modern urban societies, such as the ones we live in, offer different risks or types of risks, from kind of moving from working in agriculture to large factories, to negotiating uh, mass transit systems, or living in housing that's been shoddily built, to name just three things that might might impact on our lives. Some of this has been reflected in the growth of tort law, the area of law that's concerned with damage or loss caused by, for example, negligence. And also the law has changed, a lot more leg legislation regulating our hours at work, providing us with health and safety um, requirements. And it's also reflected in the growth of the trades unions, kind of protecting the rights of workers and also the people they work with. Likewise, the franchise has grown, more people have the vote, began with some more and more working class men getting the vote, then some women, and then all men and women at the age of 21. And if you give people the vote, you make them full citizens, and citizens in modern kind of Western democracies have rights and they need to be protected in a number of ways. Despite all these changes, lawyers were not routinely involved with the working classes as their clients. They may have employed them as domestic servants or in their offices, but they were not their normal audience. Most lawyers in the 19th century tended to come from middle or upper class backgrounds. 
In the early 1890s, General William Booth of the Salvation Army wrote a book called In Darkest England and the Way Out, which called for a poor man's tribune to offer legal aid to the poor. And this kind of reflected the feeling of Booth that access to the law was needed because people were being exploited by landlords, by their employers, by shopkeepers, and because they did not necessarily know where to start with the problems that they faced. This was also an idea that chimed with some of the male graduates at settlement houses. Settlement houses like Toynbee Hall, um, Oxford House and Cambridge House brought graduates of the, of the universities to the inner cities to live, work and to learn something of what it was to be poor. The London settlements often had residents who were starting out in legal careers, or in many cases as barristers working in the inns of court, so it was quite convenient for them to go there. One example of this was Frank Tilliard, who was at Mansfield House in Canning Town in East London, who was kind of starting out as a barrister. He, we, I haven't found evidence that he read Booth's book, but he certainly took up this idea of a poor man's tribune as a means of applying his professional knowledge to trying to help his neighbours in Canning Town. Frank Tilliard set up a poor man's lawyer in 1891, um, beginning with an evening a week in which he would give advice to the people who came along to his, uh, to his evening. And he was supported by a team of volunteers who would provide uh, what we might describe kind of social work support to the people who came along. It was in the evenings because that was when Tilliard was free and also, um, also the clients were free too. Tilliard's idea, idea spread, first of all through London, but also across the country, mostly in larger towns and cities, often where there was either a, a settlement or a university, often both, or where there were kind of um, large missions. Local law societies also became involved in providing advice. And generally, the model was the same, that it would be advice in the evening, done by the lawyers on top of their day jobs. In interwar London, the three main political parties, the Liberals, the Conservatives and Labour, ran their own free legal advice clinics, hoping to win over these new voters after 1918 by helping out with their problems. Um, using their members who might be kind of trained lawyers of one kind or another, or candidates for election drawing upon their legal training to help people directly. But not all of this was not all of it was just advice. Um, sometimes these cases needed to go to court or other kinds of action needed to be taken. And this cost money, it wasn't just the time of the lawyer, someone had to find the money to do these things. This was a problem faced by all of these poor man's lawyer um, evenings. And there were various solutions to this issue of cost. For example, the London Poor Man's Lawyer set up the Bentham Committee, which tried to provide funds for costs for particularly needy cases. The Poor Man's Lawyer, as a name, assumed that this was work for men the, to benefit those male citizens. But it was also done by men for, most, for the first kind of 20 or 30 years or so of its existence because until 1919, women could not be lawyers. It was, only, it was in the early 1920s that the first women qualified into the profession, like Carrie Morrison, the first female solicitor. Morrison, like, and many others, found themselves doing this poor man's lawyer work in Morrison's case at Toynbee Hall, partly because she was interested in justice for all, but also because she had, certainly to begin with, an uphill struggle in trying to, provide, trying to find paid work as a solicitor. As the 1920s and 1930s progressed, advice, legal or otherwise, was increasingly seen as important for citizens. So there were charities and community organisations given support for this by the National Council of Social Services, who were also involved in trying to push for greater reform of legal aid in the 1920s. The National Council of Social Services also set up the Citizens Advice Bureau on the outbreak of the settlement war as part of the recognition by both charities and government that people needed help with the practical issues raised by rationing, by being bombed out, by being called up and also dealing with relationship strain. In fact, the government thought the relationship strain was such a big problem in, in terms of morale that they liberalised divorce to kind of help people get out of unhappy unhappy relationships. During the Second World War, the Beveridge Report was released in 1942 and it outlined a blueprint for the welfare state. 
Shortly after this came out, the whole Dane Society of Socialist Lawyers called for a national legal service, along similar lines to what would be the National Health Service, free at the point of access for citizens to use. But in Britain, in the different legal jurisdictions, we have a separation between the judiciary and the state. So this National Legal Service had the problem of state-employed lawyers potentially suing the state. So that idea didn't run. There were, however, two major government reports, the Rushcliffe for England and Wales and Cameron, Cameron for Scotland, which outlined a legal aid and advice scheme for people who met certain criteria about the kinds of cases and the income that they had. So whilst it was delayed in comparison to other parts of the welfare state, in 1949, the Legal Aid and Advice Act was, um, became, became law and became part of this kind of general welfare provision. The Legal Aid and Advice Act um, set up a scheme in which lawyers could be reimbursed for their work on legal advice and illegal aid cases. So this meant for the, for the first time, this could become part of the everyday work of solicitors and barristers, rather than them trying to do it on top in the evenings. In some cases, by the 1960s, it allowed lawyers to, some lawyers to make this their main area of work. It also enabled innovative work like the neighbourhood law centres of the 1970s. But the scheme was never funded as well as it needed to be. There been various cuts to the legal aid budget since, since it was set up in 1949, and the Legal Aid Sentencing and Probation of Offenders Act was just the latest in a series of cuts to legal aid and advice, and one of the most serious. In 2017, the Justice Minister um, published statistics which showed that there had been a 20% drop in legal aid providers in five years since the Act had come into force. It's becoming harder and harder for people to access legal aid and to get that kind of support. So to go back to my kind of evenings in the 1990s, why were those kind of volunteers still, still volunteering in the evenings despite the legal aid schemes? Well, partly, as I've said, the Legal Aid and Advice Act and its kind of successors had never really been enough to tackle the need of different kinds of people. And it didn't reach some of the neediest people or cover all of the situations or offer the kind of support that people might need. It also continued because lawyers wanted to do it. Many of them found it rewarding and engaging work that could be life changing for them as much as it could be for the clients. And also because it offered a different kind of legal education to what they might have learnt in university. But we need to ask hard questions about whether volunteering is enough, about whether the state systems provide enough to ensure that the rights of citizens are being upheld, and whether it's acceptable for this to be down to lawyers to provide this, to tackle inequalities on top of their day jobs. Thank you for listening.